Well, welcome everybody. Just hoping my voice lasts. I've had a long weekend of yelling at track meets and <laughs> soccer games and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> just praying it last. Um, before we do our opening prayer, uh, since it's been two weeks, I don't remember where we stopped. <laughs> Does anyone, had anyone marked in their place? I think we're still on, I think we're just beginning the actual first woe on about the third page of the handout. Does that sound right? Okay, sorry this one's the only one that doesn't have page numbers, but it's the third page um, starting near the top. Do you have a spare? I think there's still. Last one. So let's go ahead and begin with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together as people of faith, especially during this sacred season of Lent. And we ask that as we approach the great feast of Easter and the resurrection of our Lord, that you would use the words of Amos to touch our minds and our hearts to increase our faith, hope, and charity in you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> to kind of get an overview of, of the book of Amos, <clears throat> is he, he, Amos kind of sets his, his um, chapters, or the way he, he presents the text, are in these numerical things. So he started right after the small initial introduction with the eight oracles, eight, the total number eight being a new beginning, but of those eight oracles, six are against pagan nations, with six being the biblical number for fallen mankind or humanity, two being the union of Israel with God, but also the union of Israel with Judah, that they cannot escape being the uh, fact that they're both part of the covenant people. Then we just looked at his three summonings, three being an image of the divine presence, even long before <clears throat> the Christian revelation of God as Trinity, and to this day, Israel still uses the image of three as being that of God's presence. Uh, you see that in the, um, the cry of the angels, the seraphim, that we imitate at Mass, holy, holy, holy Lord. So three is this image of God, and we went from oracles where God showed that he's the sole creator of everything, a point that uh, Amos will also touch on in smaller parts throughout his other visions, now, it seems to follow the pattern of a um, Israelite lawsuit. So God is first summoning his witnesses and the, quote, defendants to court. So he's calling his people to return to him. That doesn't work. So now we're at the next stage where he is pronouncing his judgment upon them, the three woes. And we talked about what a woe was before. Again, you have the divine presence. And so with the rejection of his call, he now sort of moves forward to give us another um, idea. And then after this, the last part has to do with five visions that culminate in this final promise of restoration at a much later date. And five is an interesting number in uh, Hebrew because in terms of sacred numbers, because it both denotes the divine teaching, Torah, that's why there's five books of the Torah. But it can also represent God's own name. Um, although there are only four letters in God's name in Hebrew, basically Yahweh, Vaheh, um, the name is always started by this little tiny, doesn't look like a circle, but this little diacritical point. So both numbers four and five can both relate to God. When they use it in the number as four, they see God as the creator. When they see it as five, they talk about the transcendent God who cannot really be grasped. And so you kind of have this, this both. That's why we have four Gospels. It's not the four corners of the earth. It's the four letters of God's name. As creator, so there's where you get the secondary aspect that it does connect to the four corners of the earth, but it's primarily to do with the Lord. So... We're seeing sort of a, a progression as we go through these different visions that Amos has. And next week, when we get, um, hopefully we'll start the last 
main handout today. I do have a little, another little tiny one because uh, in addition to the way that um, after all this talk of doom and destruction, the way that Amos actually ends with this promise of restoration <clears throat> is also connected to another prophet, um, who I, the prophet Hosea, who I've basically told you his whole story in four pages. But he's important to know because Amos is not God's last word to Israel. When Amos leaves and returns to Judah, the very same year, God calls one last prophet, Hosea. Now remember, Amos only prophesies for one year, the year before King Isaiah died. Within months, maybe even days, we don't know, but in the same year, Hosea is called, he's from the north, he's already an Israelite, and he will prophesy for 25 years until the destruction of the, temp of the, of the country of Israel. And so it's important, and the reason I wanted to give you that last tiny handout was to see how God works. Because when you contrast Amos and um, Hosea, you see the different methods in which God tries to bring people to return to him. So Amos is most definitely the prophet of judgment. Although he ends on this hopeful note of restoration someday after, under the Davidic king, uh, most of, his, most of the, the prophecies, as we've seen, are more on the judgment, punishment, failure side. Hosea will be the exact opposite. So in a lot of ways, they're opposites. You have, you have the, the poor man from Judah who prophesies for one year, and you have the more wealthier agricultural man from Israel who prophesies for 25 years. And where Amos is the prophet of judgment, Hosea is the prophet of love. So for 25 years, since punishment threats wouldn't work, God flips it and reveals for us really the first time the inner life of God that will only become more and more pronounced as we finally culminate in Christ who introduces us to the Trinity and the fact that God is love. So Hosea is the first to bring that out with the exception of one implicit verse that I went over where um, Amos uh, speaks of God as the covenantal God so there is a marriage imagery Hosea is the first prophet to bring forth the, the idea of God covenant as a marriage that will run through all the rest of the prophets and all through the New Testament so it's Hosea who brings that so where Amos comes across as the one to show us uh, the breaking of the Torah as commandments the um, power of, the, of God as the Lord and, and Savior. Uh, Hosea will come forth with the, the, the love of God as the one who loves us like his firstborn son, who loves us like his spouse, and who doesn't want Israel to be separated from him out of his deep love for her. So there is going to be, in the last uh, class, we'll sort of talk a little bit about Hosea and see how these two kind of balance each other. And Hosea will, unfortunately, be Israel's last, last prophet for 25 years. But let's return now to the, the woes. So we're looking at the first one. It's on the third page. Sorry, I don't have page numbers on this one for some reason. I forgot. And right at the top, it says the first woe. <clears throat> and the first one uh, begins with a condemnation of those who practice injustice. And so he uses this term, turn justice into wormwood, cast righteousness to the ground. And so the sweetness that justice should bring to us, the freeing nature of it, the you know, treating everyone justly, has instead become sour to become this wormwood, this really bitter tasting plant, by the corrupt judges of Israel. And what's occurring is that these judges who themselves are more and more wealthy because of their position are piling up ever mounting riches by unjustly treating the poor and accepting bribes. All these things in direct violation of the Torah. 
So this general woe will set the stage for sort of the next two. And at this point, he, he Amos, God through Amos, specifies kind of three specific crimes. The first one is he, quote, hate those who reprove at the gate and, ab and abhor those who speak with integrity. Whenever you see a reference to the gate in the Bible, realize that's where the elders of the city sat. That was true not just of Israel, but of all the pagan nations as well, ancient Greece, Rome, etc. And that is where you went to present yourself for uh, cases. Right? That's why they sat there, that they would be open for anyone to come and present their cases against each other. And so <clears throat> what we see going on here, they hate those who reprove at the gate. So in other words, those justices who are still being faithful, who are still being moral and just, are hated by most of the people because they're not deciding in their favor and they're not letting the crimes of these Israelites stand against their poorer brethren. So they hate those people. In other words, they're perverting justice to their own favor. The second one tells us they tax the destitute and exact from them levies of grain. So they demand money from those already in dire poverty so that they can spend it upon themselves. So the worst off in, in the country, materially, are also the ones having to face the great burden of taxes and problems. And there were a lot of taxes, because as I mentioned, this was Israel's golden age, but it had to finance a military unlike, unlike Israel had ever possessed. And so that costs a lot of money, and the burden for that tended to almost always fall on the poor. And then the last one's kind of a, a general statement, but again, it's, it also references the gate. They are oppressing the just, accepting bribes, turning away the needy. So in a sense, this one's kind of a summary statement of what's been going on in general. So what was happening? What do we know from other uh, non-biblical references of what was going on at this time? What was happening, as much as what was happening at the time of Jesus, 700 years later, and that is small, bank, small landowners, remember in, in Israel your heritage is the land you own, small landowners are being taxed to the point of bankruptcy by the wealthy, and then the wealthy use them as serfs, basically enslaved workers, on their own property, which now the wealthy have come to possess. Um, and so you have a, a situation occurring where Israel has, in a sense, repeated the sins of its own uh, history by taking on what the Egyptians did to them. And now, like irony of ironies in the great sinful sense, is now Israel is acting towards its own poor people as they were all acted upon and historically by being enslaved by the Egyptians. So a lot of times throughout him and in, in, in Hosea, you're going to see the reference back to the Exodus, back to Egypt, to kind of recall them back to what they were. Um, <clears throat> now, Amos, and this is always important to understand in the context, Amos is not preaching about politics in general or commerce in general, both of which he kind of accepts, he is instead calling down woe because they've corrupted these activities which should be used for good. And in doing so, um, they've really uh, turned their back entirely on the law of God. So on the very next page, which I guess would be page four, um, you see this, hand, this ex, um, indented paragraph. This comes from the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy specifically. And the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are the Torah. To this day, they are the central focus of all Israel. And all the other things, the prophets, the other writings, are all ways to understand and apply the Torah. So the Torah is basically like the Gospels of, of Judaism, except the Torah is also the basis for everything in Christianity. St. Augustine has a famous statement. He says, 
The first three chapters of Genesis are all you need to know. The rest is commentary. Because in those three chapters, we learn God's plan, how it failed, and how God will restore it. So even for Christians, the Torah occupies an important place because Jesus ultimately is the one promised in and through the Torah. Well, what does the Torah specifically say? Um, and remember, we're talking about woes, which mean curses. We've seen this, this statement of, quote, wormwood. And what about when Israel itself, or the, the chosen people, kind of go off the tracks as almost an entire society? Not individuals. There's always going to be individuals in the people of God, the church or Israel, that fail. But what do you do when the majority are failing? And so here's where, what Deuteronomy says. He says, there may be among you a man or woman or a clan or tribe whose heart is now turning away from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of the nations. There may be among you a root bearing poison and wormwood. So again, you see the connection that Amos is bringing. And he's connecting at this point to idolatry and things like that. If any such persons, after hearing the words of this curse, should congratulate themselves, saying in their hearts, I am safe, even though I walk in stubbornness of heart, thereby sweeping away moist and dry alike, the Lord will never consent to pardon them. Instead, the Lord's burning wrath will flare up against them. Every curse written in this book will, will pounce on them, and the Lord will blot out their names from under the heavens. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for doom in keeping with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. So for those who flaunt it, who say, look, I'm doing all this stuff, what's God doing? Either implying that he either is okay with their evil, or that he can't or won't do anything about it. For that tribe, that person, God personally comes to touch in a, not a good way. And notice it's all the curses falling. And this is exactly what Amos has been warning Israel about. Is like, look, the entire nation is, has this sort of, the sort of Damocles you know, hovering over them. And it's only a matter of time before that cord slips and the sword falls. That Israel has to recognize how far it has fallen away from who it's supposed to be. And so because of these crimes, those responsible for them, primarily will not get to share the fruits of these ill-gotten gains for very long. So the Lord says, Therefore, though you have built houses of stone, you will not live in them. Though you have planted choice vineyards, you shall not drink their wine. And what's interesting here is what the Lord also does, and this is verse 13, is in a sense, the Lord also obscures his plans from the powerful, the wealthy, and the educated so that they will not dream or believe in what is really coming. Therefore, at this time, he says, the wise are struck dumb, for it is an evil time. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Jesus, right? A lot. <laughs> it is not to the wealthy and the intelligent and the scribe who I've revealed myself to, but to the poor and unimportant paraphrasing, but basically Jesus says that multiple times. Not only that, in all four Gospels, which is rare, there are almost, there are only a handful of stories that all four Gospels have. The first three have almost all the same stories, but it's rare that John has them as well. But in this case, it does. In fact, not only does it have once each, some of them have it twice. So this occurs seven times in the Gospels. So it was obviously a very important uh, teaching. Now, before I look at what Jesus says, let's look at what he's quoting when Jesus makes his teaching. This is another prophet, Isaiah. Isaiah is saying the same thing as Amos, but Isaiah is speaking it more directly and, and less obscurely. So right in the middle of page four, near the bottom, you have the indented paragraph. So Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here I am, I said, send me. And he replied, Go, 
and say to this people, listen carefully, but do not understand, look intently, but do not perceive, make the heart of this people sluggish, dull their ears and close their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and their heart understand, and they turn and be healed. Now where it, apply, where it occurs in all of the Gospels is we have a misunderstanding of one of Jesus' most characteristic teachings, the parables. We tend to think of the parables as just the normal way Jesus taught, but that is not how the scriptures portray them. In the beginning, Jesus teaches quite plainly and openly. Think about the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, everything's quite open. What occurs is that people, not only the scribes and Pharisees, but even common people, start um, declaring that Jesus is himself possessed or a false prophet. In other words, they start questioning everything about his word. And so from that point on, Jesus begins to speak only in parables to the crowds. And where this occurs is the apostles finally come to him after having all these, this time of speaking plainly and say, why do you speak to them, not us? Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus responds with Isaiah's uh, statement, right? For them, it is not given to understand. You hear and see plainly, but for them, everything will be given in parables. And then he quotes, so they'll look but not see, they'll hear but not understand, etc. So parables are actually a sign of God's, Jesus' judgment on people who already don't believe. So here we see kind of this whole um, understanding that culminates in Jesus coming about. Another thing that Jesus said is, God has hidden these things from the wise and the learned, but you have revealed them to the childlike. So again and again, Jesus has this statement. Now, after this, Isaiah asks God, how long? How long will this last? Well, in his case, he's speaking to Judah, not Israel. How long will Judah not hear and listen to you, God? And God says, very next uh, paragraph, until the cities are desolate without inhabitants, houses without people, and the land a desolate waste the Lord sends the people far away. They won't hear and they won't get it or care until they're finally exiled. So what we see is a repeat in Isaiah's time, who's speaking 200 years later to Judah, of what Amos is already warning Israel, the northern kingdom, about now. Now, to understand how Semitic, especially Hebrew writing is, although it sounds to us in our modern English, that God is the one making people not understand, what he is in fact telling the prophet is this. You're going to go, and no one will care. Most will not listen to you. Most will not heed it. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, be aware. But in hindsight, those who survive will look back and say, it really was God. And then they'll repent. But notice there's kind of a, and Hosea really drives on this. This is part of what Paul calls the mystery of iniquity. And those who are in the Revelation class, we've talked about a little too. We don't know why when the word of God is heard, some of us hear it and respond and change our lives, whether a little or a lot, right? We try to conform to that. Whereas others hear the word, and not only do they reject it, they seem to oppose it and get even worse. There's no answer you and I have for that. It's just a fact that the Bible kind of highlights. Some of us accept and try to move into that. Others reject and then come to oppose it. And so nearly every one of the prophets was told the same thing, which is kind of an interesting outing when you're first starting as a prophet. Imagine, right? You've been called as a prophet. And the first thing God tells you is, here's this great message. Nobody's going to listen. Nobody, right? So being a prophet really takes a lot of courage, patience, etc. Because you're going to be going day after day, hour after hour, proclaiming, proclaiming, promising, threatening. 
and most people just don't even take you seriously. In fact, everyone seems to ignore Amos until almost the last chapter when he finally goes to the high temple and encounters the high priest. Only then does he finally get a reaction, and it's not a good one. So this, the whole prophetic mission is often that most won't hear. But again, if you, if you look forward to this in our own Christian tradition, how many Jews of Jesus' time believed in him as the Messiah? Very few overall. Very few. So this is a constant pattern we see in the Bible. That of the larger group, only this small remnant ends up being faithful and sort of moving on. Um, so if you turn the page, oh, here's what I was quoting before. Now we don't have to look at it. The indented paragraph at the, at the top is uh, Jesus' um, statement. This is from Math Matthew's version. And I give you John's version in writing in the footnotes. And then Matthew and, or Mark and Luke are almost the exact same as, as Jesus. And yet, despite all this, God continues to love Israel and pleads with them to continue to repent and to return to him. So in, in verses 14 and 15 now, he says, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. Then truly the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you claim. In other words, you claim he's with you now, he's not. But he will be if you truly seek good and not evil. Then hate evil and love good. And let justice prevail at the gate. So turn away from this evil actions you're doing. Then it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will have pity on the remnant of Joseph. Now he refers to them as the remnant of Joseph because where the tribe settled following their conquest of the whole and settlement of the Holy Land is the northern, the most powerful tribes of the north were Ephraim and Manasseh. And those were the two sons of Joseph. So in a poetic way, the north is referred to as the remnant of Joseph. Uh, Hosea will refer to the north as Ephraim instead of Israel almost all the time. Uh, Joseph himself is not counted as one of the 12 tribes because he was an Egyptian. In a sense, he's become Egyptian. And that's why you have the famous story of Joseph brings his two grand or his sons, Jacob's grandsons, for Jacob to bless them. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole tribal thing is, is you know, we, we say 12 tribes. They're not 12 tribes, right? There were 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, actually, there are, well, yeah, there are 13 sons of Jacob. Then you have Joseph, who's cut out from them. And two take his place. Uh, no, wait, sorry. Twelve, twelve tribes. <laughs> okay, even I get confused. There are twelve sons. Then you have Joseph who loses his position, but his two sons take over. Now you're at 13. So how do you get 12? Levi is never counted because they're the priests, and the priests don't own land. They can't own real property. So they're not counted as one of the 12 tribes. So that's how you get 12. Um, but notice, God is still pleading with them, even knowing it's God, he knows that they're not going to return. But he keeps asking them and promising them he will dwell in their midst, that he will be with them as they, as they claim and everything else. And if they do return to him, he will save Israel, at least that remnant, from destruction. He will have pity on them, on the, on the remnant of Joseph. Now, a remnant, as I mentioned, is kind of what is left of a particular people or nation. In the Bible, the faithful, they're the faithful minority who refuses to join in the apostasy or other sinful acts of the, that the majority are engaging in. And as such, they are spared from any catastrophe or judgment that comes upon the majority eventually. So they're the few survivors. So... Um, Elijah will talk about this later, and Paul will quote it, that out of Israel's entire nation, does anyone remember how many thousand are actually survived? 7,000 men. We don't know how many women. Only 7,000 are truthful and, and loyal to God in the end. Um, and Paul uses that to explain the remnant of his own time among the Jews, the small minority who have actually become Christian. 
as opposed to the larger ones, many of whom will be destroyed in the fall of Jerusalem in the Jewish war. So it's this kind of ongoing image throughout the Bible you have um, over and over. Now, the other thing about the first woe is in these verses, we really come back to the heart of Amos's message, a summary of uh, the true religion of Yahweh and his call to repentance, right? Israel, seek God and live. So St. James will summarize in a very similar way to what we see in Amos. In fact, James seems to, in a lot of ways, imitate the pattern that Amos follows. Here's what St. James says when he tells us what religion is. It's top of page five, the second paragraph, the italicized part. So St. James, the cousin of Jesus Christ, says, quote, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That's it in its basics. <laughs> Loving your neighbor and worshiping God correctly, not in idolatry or any of these other things. That's the main focus. Now, the first woe then ends with God proclaiming, quote, thus says the Lord, an impending punishment if they do not turn back to him. So he says, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord. And I mentioned before, whenever you see God being called out as the Lord of hosts, that's the title you don't want to hear. Because a host is his army, his military. So he's coming out in a warrior, as a warrior. Um, And so to give him that title is to indicate his rulership over all the angels who are his heavenly, quote, host, over Israel who are his main earthly host, later the church. That's why we talk about the church militant. And back in older days, uh, during confirmation, you were now a soldier of Christ and the bishop slapping the face. All this goes to this idea but because he's lord of all creation he can use any army he wishes which in this case he's going to use Assyria to bring about what he wants in his quote warfare so the title comes out and it's one of the most popular titles used by all the prophets the lord god of hosts and he says in every square there shall be lamentation in every street they shall cry no then shall summon, they shall summon the farmers to wail, the professional mourners, mourners to lament. Every, every vineyard there shall be lamentation when I pass through your midst, says the Lord. So this understanding of they're kind of threatened. Um, and the language here is very interesting. It's hard to catch in English. But notice his last thing he says, when I pass through your midst. Literally, in Hebrew, it's, it says Pesach, when I pass over you. Last time I passed over you, you survived and the Egyptians were killed. This time when I pass over you, you're going down. You are the ones now who I'm judging when I pass through in your midst, says the Lord. So the first punishment is put out there. But again, we have to, be, we have to understand the Jewish way of thinking and that is God always gives us lots of chances. Even when he says this is the last chance, he doesn't mean it, almost ever. It's always more chances. So now on to the second one. The second one is focused mo mostly around one particular idea or teaching, that of the, quote, day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh. Now, popularly, and even today among Christians, popularly we understand this to refer to when um, Yahweh himself <coughs> demonstrates his preferential love or his special relationship <coughs> to his people by concretely in history elevating them and saving them from all their calamities and such. It's what Israel believed, it's what we believe under the image of Christ. Um, however, Amos will be the first to twist that notion on its head and give us another part of it. He says, woe to those who yearn for the day of the Lord. 
what will the day of the Lord mean for you? And now he's going to tell them, he goes, look, you, you think you want God to come and save you, but you're naive. Are you really ready for God to come? Because God, simply because you're his people, doesn't okay your sins or permissively allow them to continue. When God comes, he will judge what is happening. Therefore, what will the Lord of the day of the Lord be for you? Mean for you? It will be darkness, not light. He'll repeat it in the 20th verse. Truly the day of the Lord will be darkness, not light, gloom without any brightness. God is no respecter of persons. If you sin, whether one of his people or not, you get judged. We're not escaped because we have the name Catholic or the name Israel or Judah. Nope. We're held just as responsible. Now, what he says in the middle is interesting because he gives a little, Amos gives this little, uh, I don't know what you call it, a little story to tell us um, how unaware they are of what's happening. And in that ignorance, they somehow think they can escape judgment. Not by repenting, that's how you escape judgment, by repenting, but by just sort of hiding or outrunning it. So he says, here's what the day of the Lord will be like. As if someone fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as if on entering the house he rested his hand against the wall and a snake bit him. So what's going to happen if Israel doesn't repent is they're going to experience the first threat, the lion, try to flee the lion only to run into a greater threat, the bear, take refuge from the bear in their own home only to be killed by a poisonous snake. There is nowhere to hide from the infinite God. Nowhere. And so if you think you're going to like live the way you want to live and not ever have to face it, God is very clear there is no escaping me. There is no escaping my power. As he says in Isaiah, he says, quote, Yes, from eternity I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I act, and who can cancel it? So what the prophet's main point here is this. Do not put trust in your status before God if you're also living in sin because God is the Holy One and he will punish you any who commit it, unless they repent. So our status, again, isn't going to help them. But Israel's stubborn refusal to return will only be met by calamity. Darkness, not light. Gloom, not brightness. So they're not getting it. They're so secure in their understanding that we're the people of God, etc., that they can't even see what's coming. Again, if you point forward to the time of Jesus, we see this from the very beginning before even Jesus' ministry. If you remember, John the Baptist comes out and he starts to address um, the people. And for example, if, uh, I'll just read Luke's account. In Luke chapter 3, here's what the Baptist says. He said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, the crowds, all Jews. Matthew's a little more specific. He says the priests and Levites, or the, the Levites and scribes. Um, and the Pharisees. John, uh, Luke says, no, it was everybody. <laughs> so he tells all the Jews, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce good fruits as evidence of your repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God can raise up children of Abraham from these very stones. That's what Amos is saying. Do not think because you're a Jew or an Israelite, you're okay. God is judging you just as he judges everyone else. And you, in fact, it may be worse for. Why? Because you know better. You're his. You can't claim the ignorance the pagan can claim. You know, and therefore, you're responsible. And so the Israelites of Amos' time did expect some kind of divine intervention. And they couldn't get past the fact that if God intervenes, it couldn't mean anything but favor, be favorable to them. It's going to definitely be in our favor. 
But Amos is trying to dispel the illusion they fall under because there will indeed be a judgment, he tells them, but it will be against them and not for their benefit unless, again, they change their way. So you, can, you see it's the same pattern. There's nothing new Amos is really saying. He's simply saying the same thing from hitting it from different angles to get the people to kind of finally kind of grasp what's going on. But they just can't see it. Um, and so following this, he then adds to it by saying, and look, don't think you're going to pacify God by your false religion and idolatry. God's not going to accept that. So he says what happens in the very next part, verses 21 to uh, 25. He says, I hate, this is God speaking, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no pleasure in your solemnities. Even though you bring me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Your stall-fed communion offerings, I will not look upon them. Take away from me your noisy songs, the melodies of your harps. I will not listen to them. Rather, let justice surge like waters and the righteousness like an unfailing stream. That's where Martin Luther King Jr. got his statement. Did you bring me sacrifices and grain offerings for 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? So notice... God now is going to contrast the time of the Exodus in which Israel almost offered no sacrifice to God during that 40 years. In fact, they didn't even have another Passover until they entered with Joshua. And yet, they were, for the most part, at least that second generation, more favorable, more trusting in the Lord, more obedient. And now you have, in the case of Israel, um, the, the best in terms of you know, uh, in terms of the amount of offerings and the great what the what it looks like and the pageantry of it, greater than every before ever before in any of the chosen people's history, and yet it's empty of any interior dedication or devotion. And so he tells us what they need to do. He says, "Look, your your worship of me isn't going to do it until quote." you become just and righteous. Right? Do you want to prove to me that your worship means something? Then let me see it in the love of neighbor. Remember, that's not a Christian thing. It comes from Leviticus 19.15. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not new. It's just Jesus brings it to the forefront of what the prophets were already approaching through that time period. And so oh, what God is saying in a lot of different ways here. Um, is basically that our sacrifice, if it's simply external beauty, it really looks good on the outside, and even overabundant, ostentatious, we might even say, but it's not really grounded in an interior devotion and dedication to the Lord, is meaningless to God. That's not what he's looking for not what he's looking for. He's looking for the real love and devotion that when offering the sacrifice, the person is really committing themselves and showing their commitment um, to the Lord. And as he makes clear, there was little opportunity for these things during the time of wandering in the Exodus, yet the people were close. Now the opposite, ironically, is the case. They offer sacrifices in huge numbers, but their heart is far from the Lord. And to make matters even worse, as he'll go on to say in the very next verse, not only are they worshiping God wrongly, but they've added to the worship of God pagan deities. So the next verse, verse 26, he said, Yet you will carry away Succoth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star images, star image, your gods that you have made for yourself. So he mentions two of the pagan gods. We know who they are, the gods of Arabia, um, that... Israel is worshiping. So Israel not only is not worshiping God correctly, not obeying the Torah and love of neighbor, they've added to that other pagan deities, which seem to have been the deities of that region, you know, as a second chance or a, just in case, which isn't really faith. There's that whole story in Maccabees, if you remember, when the, the Maccabees are, army is fighting to rededicate the temple, which they ultimately do. That's Hanukkah. 
And that's where the story of purgatory first emerges. After the battle, they go to pick up the bodies of the Jews who fell. Now, these were Jews who actually, unlike the Israelites per se, were fighting for the temple and for God to be, for it to be reclaimed. So they have a very righteous thing, and they do, they do believe. However, as they start getting these bodies they, ready for burial, they begin to notice something interesting. It says they're wearing amulets sacred to the gods of Jomnia. Mm -hmm. Good luck charms. We might, in our modern day, laugh, but basically, you're hedging your bets, right? I'm fighting for God. He's going to save me, but just in case, I'll wear this so that God might save me if the other one doesn't. Well, Israel can't even claim that one because they're not hedging. They're so much bringing idolatry in. But what's interesting, he says, as I exile you beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. In other words, you're... Your petty fake gods aren't going to save you on my day. They're going to go into exile with you as you carry their statues away and everything else. They're certainly not going to be able to, in any way, save you from what's coming. Now, he specifically uh, refers to three types of sacrifice. And we mentioned this earlier because, again, Amos tends to repeat things. He mentions the burnt offering, grain offerings, and communion offerings. Each one, there were five. Now, in the temple in Jerusalem, there were five types of sacrifices that were offered at the temple. We do not know if the false temples, the two of them built by is the Israelites, offered the exact same five, but we know they at least offered three of them. What were they? The whole burnt offering. That's where you brought the animal, and the entire animal was burnt up with no portion left for either the priest or the person who offered it. The technical term is Holocaust, hence why Jews refer to the Nazi thing as the Holocaust, because they were offered up entirely. Um, it was considered to be one of the most pious sacrifices because you got nothing in return. You had to bring one of your best animals, unblemished, and you got to keep no part of it. It's gone. You didn't get to eat it. It's done. So it was an act of real faith and trust that you would bring this and this valuable thing and just give it over to God. It was the trust that God would continue to provide for you. Right? Sort of like Jesus in our Lord's Prayer. Give us each day or this day our daily bread. I trust God's going to still support me. I'm giving him sort of the best I have in this sacrifice. So God says, that one's not going to work. Even though, generally speaking, in the theoretical sense, that would be one of the greatest acts of faith. The grain offerings were used to symbolize the covenant between Israel and Yahweh. Um, and the reason the grain was symbolized that is because it was non-corruptible and lasting. So you would burn part of the grain on the altar itself, uh, just a, a portion of it, and the rest would be kept by the offerer, some would be kept by the priest, and then they would make use of the rest. And for the priest, it was in, in Jerusalem, not necessarily in Israel, that's what we, they would make the um, showbread, the 12 loaves of bread, the kind of precursor of the Eucharist that only the priest could eat later. That one also won't work, even though it's a symbol of the covenant. And then the communion sacrifice offerings, which I mentioned last time because um, they're kind of the most interesting one, is all the other offerings were required. In other words... If you did X, then offering Y was required. So you have these kinds, and then there's the sin offering, there's the guilt offering, there's all these different kinds. The communion offering, which is also referred to as the thank offering, or the thanks give offering of thanksgiving, and sometimes it's called the votive offering, Offering just like we have votive candles, all of them are the same thing, just for whatever reason, different English translations have used different meaning. In Hebrew, the term is the Todah. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, about two to three hundred years before Jesus, the Greeks, long before Jesus, so several hundred years before him translate this as 
the Eucharist. Because that's what it means, to give thanks. He broke the bread, gave thanks through his time. So that's why we call it the Eucharist. So it's interesting. Now the thing about this sacrifice was it's entirely voluntary. It does not ever have to be offered for any reason. The person who does it completely does it on their own. Um, that's where the term votive. Volt means will in Latin. So it's a free will offering. It would be offered in various things. You might offer it if God blessed you in some way and you wanted to show your appreciation. You might make a vow and when it happened, then you said, okay, God did what I asked, so I'm gonna offer a sacrifice to show in my thanksgiving. It, it could be offered in a variety of, of reasons, but it was always voluntary, never required. And unlike the other sacrifices, when it was offered, the animal was basically divided in parts. The priest took some and ate a portion right there and then kept the rest of their portion to eat with the other priest. And the father of the family who offered that sacrifice um, ate some there publicly at the altar and then took the rest home. And what that image signified of the father representing his family and the priest representing God is that God and that family, God and that particular family had become the same blood. In other words, they're family now because you don't eat with strangers in the ancient world. You show hospitality, but you never eat with them. So you bring them in, and notice the monks still do this, right? You go to Prince of Peace, you eat. They don't eat while you eat. They eat in their own room, later or before. So hospitality, to eat with somebody meant you only eat with family members. So it was Im the image of it was that the two have become one. It's sort of a marital family, father, son, husband, wife image. Um, and then the father would take the rest of the, the animal home and he would invite all his family and or friends over and they would feast on that animal in a, in a meal to kind of connect themselves now to what was happening to God. So even that sacrifice and what it means when it came from um, the false religion, the idolatry of, of Israel, God says, none of those three will help even though generally speaking, these would be deep ex uh, expressions of real devotion, Amos just mocks it all on behalf of God. He says, it's not real, right? It's all pretentious, it's all superficial, it's all just meant to, um, to sort of impress God, so to speak. And so he's, what, what we've seen Amos speak about, and he's gonna mention again soon in the other woe, is, there is no ritual that Yahweh will accept from apostate Israel, not even those who are the considered the greatest kinds of offerings, because of their self-indulgence and their laziness. Instead, the only thing he'll accept at this point is national repentance. That's the only thing that can save Israel now, is to turn away and say, look, none of this can help us. We have to change our whole lives. Now, as part of this, Yahweh also condemns their music, and commands them to take away their noisy songs, um, right? Paul sort of alludes to this when he talks about um, love and such, right? And he says, uh, um, if, I, if I speak but I don't have love, what? I sound like a gong or a cymbal, just bang, bang. That's sort of what Amos is bringing the, the imagery here as well. And it's important to realize that um, music was, was, learn, was used both in liturgical worship the temples, but what we don't, what most people don't know is, is music all, also accompanied the prophets preaching. If you look closely, most of them tell you about music being prevalent when they did it. So it was in this religious music that was brought forth by their disciples and such that the prophets would speak forth their prophecies in poetry form. We don't always get that because of English. So basically God's saying, you know, he's rejecting their worship, he's rejecting their prophets, and to return to him. Now again, just as he did earlier with politics and commerce, 
Amos, nor God, is not condemning liturgical activity in itself. Instead, what is being rejected is the Israelites' attempt to offer worship with unclean hands. Um, this goes back to the very sort of beginnings of prophecy. Now, the first prophet, actually the first person named a prophet in the Bible is Abraham. But Moses is really the prophet when Israel thinks of it. And in fact, even Thomas Aquinas in the Sumo, he has the question, question 174, he says, uh, was Moses the greatest prophet? And, and Aquinas, as a Catholic, ends definitively, yeah, he was. Because Jesus isn't a prophet in that sense. He's something far greater. But as the prophets go, no one surpassed Moses. But after Moses, the next prophet to kind of become popular is that of Samuel. And it's from Samuel that all the later prophets, not Moses, who is unique, sort of draw their language. He's the one who first says, thus says the Lord, and all this kind of language. What he also does is it's first Samuel, and I think we mentioned this before in an earlier one, because again, Amos repeats it, the idea, who puts forth the idea that it's obedience and loyalty that God really wants. And if you don't have that, your sacrifices and worship is meaningless. So, for example, Israel has become like King Saul. King Saul sought to worship God in his own manner, although he saw it as being obedient, and Samuel was sent to him by God to tell him no. So right in the middle of the next page, you have this indented paragraph, and, and this or similar statements come up a lot in the prophets and other writings, and in fact, Jesus uses it. Here's what Samuel tells Saul, and this is really what Amos is warning Israel about. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to the Lord's command? Obedience is better than sacrifice. To listen, better than the fat of rams. For a sin of divination is rebellion, and arrogance the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord in turn has rejected you. Now, if you look down to footnote 58, that's from Hosea directly. Then I give one from Proverbs. I didn't want to give all of them. There's too many. But then Jesus taught it as well. Language slightly different, but basically same idea. Jesus said, quote, Go and learn the meaning of the words, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you knew what this meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned these innocent men. Talking about his, his disciples being accused of not following the law. So even for Jesus, he's telling us, look, our sacrifice has to spring from a, a open, trusting, loving heart. I mean, Jesus actually says a lot about sacrifice if we, if we think about it. right? He says if you hold anything against your neighbor and you're there at the altar itself, right about to offer, what does he say? Leave. Go be reconciled, then offer it. You don't want to offer it in a state where you have anger or hatred or judgment in your heart. So this idea is something that the prophets were already bringing forth. But again, the only thing at this point that Yahweh will accept is not sacrifices, which mean nothing at this point because they're not offered with real in intent or attention, but they're the national repentance of the people. And how do they show that national repentance? In two ways. First, by showing that they're living according to the precepts of the love of neighbor. So the part that's quoted by Martin Luther King Jr., rather let justice surge like waters and righteousness like an unfailing stream. Then get rid of the idolatry and worship God with this kind of open heart to others, and then that will be acceptable. That'll be the proof. Instead, what's happening is um, they're practicing a superficial, though extravagant, religious practices. But they're really a perversion of real sacrifice. Israel's worship at this time in history is characterized by this ostentatious display of wealth. 
Remember earlier when he condemned the women, the cows of Bashan, how much they offered monetarily wise and with sacrifices every single day. Um, and so it's all this display of wealth and pomp, etc. In other words, it looks just like the pagan, the nation itself. The nation itself is falling apart, and Israel's religion has come to adopt that as its view and way of doing things as well. And instead, they disregard the moral implications of their faith in God, which results then in God's real anger, because he sees that although they're outwardly displaying faith, in truth, they have very little. Again, I want to mention St. James. We have two parts of him here. The one is a smaller one up at the top, first paragraph. Again, St. James kind of touches on this as well. He says, quote, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, his religion is vain, then he's going to tell us. So what is um, pure religion? Well, we've already seen it. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That type of worship that Israel is offering is not only not, not worth anything to God, it's actually objectively sinful. So real brief, and then we'll take our, our break, is I have this long section here from James to show us how this moves forward into Christianity. And James is criticizing the same things we see in the Christian community of his time as Amos is criticizing in the Israelite community of his time. And so we'll, we'll mostly look at the bold parts. In the first part, he criticizes the partiality that's being shown in public worship based on people's wealth, which should have no status whatsoever in the church and before God. So he says, my brother, show no partiality as you adhere to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if a man with gold rings on his fingers and in fine clothes comes into your assembly and a poor person in shabby clothes also comes in and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here, please. While you say to the poor one, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil designs? Right? How are you treating the people in the mass itself, in church itself? How do you treat them when people come for help or different things in the church? He goes on, really talking about now the love of neighbor. So down to the, that second bold part, but down to the last like three or four lines. He says, if you fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but falls short in one particular has become guilty in respect to all of it. That comes from Jesus, actually, too, um, where Jesus says it's slightly different, but I'll just mention it really quick. You don't have to turn there. But it comes in his... Um, comes a few places, but the one I think of readily is it comes in his um, statement where he's criticizing the scribes and Pharisees. And he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier things of the law, judgment and mercy and fidelity. So basically he tells the scribes, look, you're majoring in the minors. You're doing all the little things that God requires, but the big things you're leaving aside. So in other words, you're so concerned with the crossing the I or crossing the T's and dotting the I's of your little religious practices, where at the same time, you're neglecting judgment, mercy, fidelity. However, he now springs something on us, Jesus says. But these <clears throat> you should have done without neglecting the others. In other words, you still need to show judgment, mercy, and fidelity, but you don't get off the hook for neglecting the other. Have, what do you have to do? All of it. All of it. And that's what James is saying as well. He says, you can't break one law and think you're okay because, hey, I passed 99 of them, but I missed these five or six. Right? We don't get to balance it out. That's not how it works. So 
we're meant to try to be perfect. So he, he ends by saying this, so speak and act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. For the judgment is merciless to one who has not shown mercy. So if you're not merciful, guess what? Jesus tells us, and it's in a sense, it's a terrifying thing. You and I create our own standard for judgment. Okay? That's what the Lord's Prayer says. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others who trespass against us. And then he'll even end the Lord's Prayer, which a lot of people don't notice, in his very next statement, um, what Jesus says following that, is he's very clear about what he just stated. Because he says... Um, if you, forgive, <clears throat> if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. So he's not speaking piously like it would be a nice thing to do. He's telling you literally, as merciful as you are to others, that's the amount of mercy God will show you when you come for judgment. That's why he says it's merciless to one who has not shown mercy. But then his next statement is interesting. He says, but mercy triumphs over judgment. If you are merciful, that will go a long way in your vindication on the last day. Not that we want to say it makes up for sins per se, but it in some way shows a place of heart that, is, that God is willing to overlook some of these other things because you've kind of from the heart sought to be merciful. And then he makes the statement, which is really what Amos is saying too. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. He says, if a brother or sister has nothing to wear and no food for the day, and one of you says to him, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also, faith of itself, if it is, does not have works, is dead. Indeed, someone may say, you have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. So he's kind of bringing up the position, again, that Amos is talking about. Look, you have the intellectual thing you're doing, but the actions and the, what's going on inside, they're not connecting. And then he makes a, a powerful statement if you really think about what he says. James says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. I love that because he, he shuts down any idea that we superior, superior like theological understanding of God intellectually means anything. He says, you know God is one. Great. The demons know that and they're not saved. That's what he's implying. That the demons know that. They probably know it better than you and I do in this world. They have a better experience of God as Trinity than we do until we pass over. So that's not going to save you. Just saying you know things, you have faith and assent, but without the works that go into it. So he finally ends by saying, he gives some examples. Then he says, see how a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. For just the body without a spirit is dead, so also, also faith without works is dead. What he does here at the end, James, and then we'll take our break. A human person is a body-soul connection. They're not separate parts. They are two aspects of the same reality. And what he's telling us now is that that inner part of us is our faith. But it is only proven and manifested by what we do outwardly. So in other words... Both have to be in unison. They're never going to be absolutely perfect. That's just our fallen nature. But our works have to flow from a real faith in God. We can't just do external works like the Israelites are doing without really deep faith and expect that it means anything to God. It's just external. However, although this isn't Amos's issue, but this is James's issue, we can't claim some kind of intellectual understanding and not live it out and expect that we're any better off either. In modern terms, in psychology, we call that the knowing-doing gap. I know what I'm supposed to do, but do I ever actually do it? Right? We know drugs and 
cigarettes and alcohol and all kinds of things kill us. I mean, we know that. There's no argument, argument about that. We know it. Yet, how many people does that actually change their behavior? Well, now when you, look, you just put that into religion, you have the same thing. You know, I can recite the whole Bible. I know the catechism inside and out. But I don't do anything. I go to Mass, and I should and need to. But even at the end of Mass, the priest tells you, now you have to go out and live the Mass. I forget what they say now. They kind of ruined it, the, in my opinion. They ruined the point. Because originally it says, go the Mass is ended. Right? E.K. Misa S. That's where we get the word mass, from the very last thing the priest or the deacon says. Misa, the same word is mission, missionary, mass. It's all the same thing. So what the deacon or priest is telling you at the end is, look, you've received the word of God and the body of Christ. Now go out and bring it to the world. So even the end of the mass is meant to let us know this isn't good enough in and of itself. Holiness has to be lived because the point of us is to become conformed to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, every word, thought, and deed, as much as we can, we'll never fully get there in this life, but we have to continually seek to make our entire self, in thought, word, and deed, conform more and more and lived out in that imitation of Christ. Right? That's why we start the Mass by first saying, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and what I have failed to do. And then later before the Gospel, after we've actually asked forgiveness for this, for the small ones, right before the Gospel, we say a Gospel according to blank. And we draw a cross over our head, over our lips, and over our heart. To indicate after I hear this, now I know how to how to conform these to Jesus. Okay. All everything we're doing is sort of pointing us to that. So let's go ahead and take our break. We're almost done. We only have like a page or two in this handout, and then we can um, we'll answer questions, and then we can move on to the next and final main handout of our class. Is that the reason why Luther did not like James? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> did he ever try to argue that, or did he ever try to debate that with any of the any of the elite of the church? I don't think so. In his dis the only time he ever debated anyone was Cardinal Cahayton, but I don't think it, it revolved around that particular book. It more had to do with the real meaning of indulgences, the authority of the church fathers. But I could be wrong. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, so it wasn't when it was an initial thing. So it was something that. Yeah, Luther took steps. First he first he just fought against indulgences. Those are the low hanging fruit. Right. And then um, he moved on from there and you know, he kind of took different steps. And he sort of said that um, the 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 church fathers, some were right and some were wrong. So he basically placed all the fathers of the church under his opinion. Uh, so little by little what he did is in a sense he took away from himself I don't know if it was purposeful from the beginning or he kind of was just ad hoc by the time he looked at himself the only thing he had left was the Bible and so at that point then he more explicitly denied the authority of the church the, the fathers all the different things um, but that will take four years so seven. we always think of um, uh in 17, or I mean, in 1517, we talk about the his 99 thesis, but Luther's not excommunicated till 1721. So it, it actually is three to four years it takes of the church trying to get him to say, basically say you're wrong, right? <laughs> we accept some of your criticisms, but those aren't things that were being taught normally by the church anyway. Those were taught by some really bad Dominicans. Um, I mean, we know the one who was teaching in, uh, in Germany near, near um, Luther at that time. His name was Tetzel. And he was excommunicated by the church later because he wasn't teaching what the church taught. He was teaching, telling really poor, ignorant people, not only can you save and speed up the time in purgatory, 
if you buy indulgences, you can save your relatives who've gone to hell. Ooh. Well, the church never teaches that, wow. ever did. And so that's what Luther was actually, Luther was correct in that sense. At least the Dominican led by, the group led by Tetzel in his region were really off the mark. Um, it's one of those interesting times in history, and I can't remember which pope it is, but you had, you had like this perfect storm in the sense of, of something would probably go unresolved. Um, the pope at that time, and I forget which one it was, had come from the highest ranks of the nobility, but he himself had given away, unlike many of the popes before or after him during that time period, he himself had personally given away every dime he owned towards the building of St. Peter's. Right? And that's what most of the indulgences at that time were being used for was to build St. Peter's. And he really could not, they couldn't, they, it, it, you couldn't have two men who were more different and they just couldn't see. The Pope couldn't understand what this German Augustinian's issue was after they had already clarified that yes, he was correct about that, but the teaching indulgences itself is not wrong, but yes, the false teaching that was being given was, and he couldn't understand why there was still the argumentation. And Luther, for his point of view, just, you know, he just, just already had in his mind that the church is corrupt, the church is this or that. And so you really had two men who could not even understand each other. So there were personalities involved too. Oh yeah. And so many other things, you know, if, if, um, if, you know, we, we look back and even in that middle ages, we hear places like France, Germany, we have to realize those are just regions. They weren't nations like they are today, states, right? They were, they were subject states of the larger Holy Roman empire. And it's right at that time period in history where a lot of these, quote, subject or regions of the Holy Roman Empire have now over time developed their own language, their own culture to some extent. And so there's a real movement to break away from the Holy Roman Empire politically. And for some, that also meant, not necessarily for any deep religious reasons, but for some of them that also meant, well, that also goes hand in hand with having to break from the, the papacy because clearly the papacy is the religious authority which gives the authenticity to the Holy Roman Empire, emperor. So you had a lot going on. And they so, wanted land too, the, Ger the German. Right, you had, all, you had all, all this stuff coming where you wanted, nations were now seeking to be their own nations and whether it was religion or not, they were gonna use religion as, as the means by doing that. Um, you had the invention of the printing press which had only happened about 30 years prior or else the Bible couldn't have become as well you know, able to be handed out as it was. So it was a lot of things that kind of came together at that time period. I mean, there's, you know, there's no doubt that roughly about every three to 400 years, the church finds itself in bad straits. I mean, if you look historically, it's about every three to 400 years, they really fall into serious problems that they have to kind of be reformed from. Because um, a lot of scholars say if it hadn't been for the Franciscan and Dominicans in the 1200s, it probably would have happened then. Because the church was so bad, things were so terrible, that it was only with the birth of these two mendicant orders that then went forward and really spread the gospel and lived it in a very different way than they saw among the clergy and such and the wealthy that you had the church kind of um, stave off this period because there were tons of heretics at this period in time from the very powerful like the Cathars or the Albigensians as they're called to weird ones like the Valdensians who were named after Peter or uh, Petro Valdus. Now this guy was, talk about, <laughs> he found this, this, I'm not kidding. Some people are just nuts. The sadder thing is, is why would people follow this guy? But whatever, maybe he was really charismatic. He was walking one day and he had, a, he had some kind of experience. Either he tumbled and fell, something happened, he knocked himself out or was injured. And he looked up and he was in a glade where he had fallen down this hill and uh, had fallen from a tree, a very large branch. And it had it fallen so hard it just fell into the muddy ground and stayed. And it was in the shape of sort of a big Y. And according to Valdez, 
he heard an angel tell him, um, pick up this staff and go forth and um, basically tell people that uh, the Messiah is near and you're going to be the one to bring him forth. And depending on which way he held it, either he or God had two-thirds of the power at that time and the other one had one-third. Yeah, exactly, right? So when I hold it this way, I have two-thirds of the power and God only has one-third, but he loves me and trusts me. But then if I turn the stick this way, then he has two thirds. I mean, just a nut. So you had, I mean, you had the product, you had the, there were Protestants yet, but you had heretics who went from the really weird to the Cathars and Albigensians who basically to the out, to the average Catholic who didn't know, looked outwardly like super ascetic religious Catholics. Um, the, the, their own name for themselves was the Cathars. It means the pure ones. We have words like catharsis and such and healing. What they came to be called was the Albigensians because they were, their main headquarters were in a place called Albigenses, France. And the Cathars were Gnostics, pure and simple. They believed that the body was thoroughly evil and that the body had to be so overcome in order to be saved. Therefore, their, quote, priests and monks looked to the average Catholic who didn't know like these really ascetic holy men and women. But what they didn't know is they were trying to starve themselves to death. That was the best way to definitively go to God was to so overcome any of the body you didn't even care if you ate and drank. Now, for the lesser Cathars, when they didn't have sex or marriage by any means, right? anything earthly, material, was physical, was bad. So they're going to die out eventually. Eh? Right. The way they were able to stay is because they would attract all these followers who were like the second second stage, second people who weren't willing to entirely give up everything yet. So they would still be having children that the Cathars could come. And for them, they would need to... And here's where you see more and more at, once you creep beneath the surface how a lot of these groups are really as far from Orthodox Christianity as possible. Well, what about these people? How would they then get to heaven? Well, they'd be, have to be reincarnated. So yes, they believed in reincarnation as Christians, semi-Christians. And then on the second time around, or third, or whatever it took, they'd finally reach that point where they were really to, wed it, willing to give themselves entirely to that thing. Um, that's why... For example, the rosary, which comes out of both the Dominican and the Franciscan tradition, the one we use today is, is the Dominican one with five decades. The Franciscan one has seven. But that's why all the mysteries are so tied to bodily things. Jesus' birth, Mary's pregnancy, all the, the resurrection of his flesh, his ascension in his body to heaven, because it's directly opposing the Cathars. So that's what, that was really the, the main focus of the Dominicans especially was to counteract the Cathar um, threat. And it was a threat. They weren't, they, they gained enough followers quickly that they had really become in a sense a powerful though still minority quote group. Powerful enough that for the first time in history, only time in history I'm aware of, Pope Innocent III who is himself one of my favorite popes, just because he's so interesting and amazing, when he was elected pope, he wasn't even a deacon. He was a canon lawyer. So in one day, Innocent III was um, ordained deacon, priest, bishop, and consecrated pope, all in one day. Wow. And he did things that are, are really, that had long-term effects. One, he is the, the pope that um, gave his permission for the formation of the Franciscan and Dominican orders. So he's that pope. Uh, he's the pope who, again, this may be a first, I'm not entirely sure, but if not, it definitely hasn't happened many times. He's the one who excommunicated the entire nation of Britain because they had refused to accept his choice of the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
And what that meant in medieval times where people took that seriously was that meant when you were under the indictment of excommunications, there could be no masses given, no burials, nothing. The church would do nothing. So the church literally closes its doors. Sorry, no baptisms, no funerals, take care of it all yourself. No Eucharist, no anointings, nothing. And that's famous Prince John or King John. John's, the, 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 it, take, it took such a short time for huge unrest throughout the whole nation of, of England that that was why the nobles were able to, able to seize that, that point in time, and that's when the Magna Carta is written, which would forever reduce the king and queen of monarchs power in England, directly due to the response of Innocent III. And then it only lasts like two and a half weeks because even by you know, carrier pigeon, which was the fastest then, John was ready to, to secede and say, okay, I'll take your guy, right? Just send him. The other thing that he did that I do believe is the only case in history is the Dominicans were not able on their own to overcome the Albigensian threat. So France at that time, um, or in the region called of the Franks, France at that time, the Franks had two types, had, had, had two distinct cultures that had arisen. Um, you had the Franks that were more to the west, and they spoke what's called the lingua ya, and France, French in the east spoke the lingua oui. In other words, the German-speaking French, and what would become the French-speaking French. Which it's funny because today, a lot of people, especially Americans for some reason, think France, French is this beautiful, romantic language. In the Middle Ages, they were made fun of. Everyone's like, good God, those barbarians are trying to speak Latin, and they, it doesn't sound anything like Latin, right? If you read French, you can figure out what it means if you know Latin well, but it's not pronounced in any way the same. Well, anyway, Albigenses stood on this part of the, in the region. So the nobility of the, the French of the East went and they proposed to Innocent the, the Third this. They said, if, if you call a crusade in Christendom, in Europe, against the, um, the Cathars, the, Albig the Albigensians, we will ensure the threat is ended. And the Pope said, done. So and so he kept, they wiped them out so much, mm -hmm. no Frenchman spoke German after that, and French, French became the language of all the French people. Oh, and only past the Rhine, where you had German, Germany proper, was German still spoke. So the reason this French speak Fran French is also in some sense due to Innocent the Third. So anyway. Okay. How do we get? Now. Yeah. How do we get on this? We're way out. anyway. <clears throat> okay. So the third woe, which starts chapter six, um, the final woe. So this is the third, the third and final one. Is really directed against the leadership, the king, the nobility, the wealthy merchants and priests, and the reason we know that is he says, "Woe to those who are complacent in Zion, secure on the Mount of Samaria." And as I mentioned before, the higher you went up on the mount was, was distinguished where you fell socioeconomically, right? The poorest people would occupy the first level because that would be the first place invaded. Then there'd be walls to the second level, ultimately up to the nobility, and then the king's citadel even within that. So by speaking about the Mount of Samaria and things like that, um, we see this, the that he's talking about the, the very wealthy and the leadership, the elites of Israel's society. Now what's interesting is Amos, even though he's speaking to the northern nation of Israel, cannot help but also give a little jab to his own people of Judah because he mentions Zion. Well, Zion's clearly not northern Israel. It's, it's the mount upon which the temple sits and the king and Jerusalem. So he does give a little dig that that they should start paying attention too to what's happening. 
And he says, leaders of the first among nations to whom the people of Israel turn. Then he says, pass over to Kalna and see, go down, go from there to Hamath the Great and down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms or is your territory greater than theirs? So all these things that don't mean anything to, to us. Um, these are famous cities of the ancient world that were once thought to be impregnable. But by the time that Amos speaks his prophecy, all have been destroyed. So he's warning Israel, saying, don't think you're, you're safe. Gath thought it was safe. Hamath saw all these places. Hamath thought it was safe. Kalna thought they were safe. It all turned out to be a lie. Don't believe in the power of your own military, etc. In other words, you have to be aware of who's coming against you. So he asks, you know, are you better than these kingdoms? Is your territory greater? You who would put off the day of disaster, yet hasten the time of violence. So we've just talked about the day of the Lord. You want to put off that day of your judgment, and yet you're only making it come faster because... Your, of your actions. You're hastening this time that will only end in, in violence. And then he really um, goes off about kind of the um, soft, effete men and the indulgent women who rule the place. He says, those who lie on beds of ivory and long, lounge upon their couches, eating lambs taken from the flock and calves from the stall, who improvise to the music of the harp, composing on musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best oils, but are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. So it's interesting, we actually have a bunch of vices listed here, right? They're slothful, they're gluttonous, they're prideful, and so it's, it's leading them this soft lifestyle where they've broken away from the discipline of the Lord is really leading them to this place of destruction. At the, at the top of this page where I mention this, Jesus says similar things. Quote, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John, John the Baptist. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you more than a prophet. What did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine garments? Those who dress luxuriously and live sumptuously are found in royal palaces. Jesus has the same disdain for that. In fact, he'll call Herod that fox and all kinds of other things about him. So these people who kind of live this super easy life without any difficulty, and it's not just that, one of the clinchers that he says is this. They, they do all this stuff. They drink the best wine. They anoint themselves, which was a way he's speaking about beauty in this sense, not in any kind of religious sense. Their beds are ivory, which is true because we found them archaeologically. I don't know how comfortable that is, but mm -hmm. I guess if it's really wealthy, you don't care, right? Like, look at my bed of ivory. So um, their lambs that they take. Remember, you didn't eat meat a lot in those days. Very expensive. Um, calves from the stall. However, the final clincher of the second half of verse C also condemns them. But they are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. So they're, they're very willing to indulge themselves on all the material goods that their prosperity has brought them. And yet they're completely indifferent to the immorality that has come to reign throughout their entire kingdom. They just don't care. They're completely, they're not made ill, they're not bothered by the collapse, the moral, spiritual collapse of Joseph. Again, the image of the northern kingdom. And although they might think themselves secure on the Mount of Samaria, they will have the same fate that befell these other places. And although they're reveling in their luxury now, soon they'll be at the head of the columns, those who actually live, going off into slavery. Verse 27, the last verse, as I exile you, or excuse me, as, as I, uh, where is it? Verse seven, therefore now they shall be the first to go into exile 
and the carousing of those who lounged shall cease. Now, in this, God is um, very serious um, because in the very next verse, God swears by his very self. In other words, that's God saying, this is going to happen. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You've reached the point where the, the, the balance has fallen too far, and it has to be rectified no matter what. So the Lord God is sworn by his very self, an oracle of the Lord, the God of hosts. You have both oracle of the Lord, which is kind of the most serious of the prophetic statements, kind of like when Jesus says, Amen, Amen, I say to you. And then you have the double thing of him also called the Lord of hosts. And he tells us, now before he was disgusted by their religion, now he's just disgusted by them. He says, I abhor the pride of Jacob. I hate his strongholds. And I will hand over the city, Samaria, the capital, with everything in it. Should there remain ten people in a single house, these shall die. When a relative or one who prepares the body picks up the remains to carry them out of the house, if he says to someone in the recesses of the house, is anyone with you? And the answer is no one. Then he shall say, silence, for no one must mention the name of the Lord. So in other words, this devastation will be so bad that even if a home were to theoretically possess survivors, those two will die. And when the survivors do come in order to claim the bodies, they will be silent. Notice the superstition here. Even now at the end, the superstition. Because they don't want to draw God's anger by mentioning his name. Right? Very superstitious. Ooh, if I say God's name, he's going to be looking at me. But even at the end, they're filled with superstition, not any real remorse or anything like that. And so he tells them, um, when, uh, to care, indeed, the Lord has given this command to shatter the great house to bits and reduce the small house to rubble. So all of the great palaces, everything is going to fall. And then he has this interesting paradoxical statement. And the point of the statement, I'll tell you before I say it, is it's supposed to make us clear that what Israel is doing, Israel's apostasy, Israel's idolatry, is so unnatural, it makes no sense. Right? They are the people of God. They know him. He's cared for them. He's blessed them. He's done all these things for them. And so the fact that they're doing this and living this way is, to God's, even God's mind, is shocking. And that's why he uses this odd paradoxical statement. He says, can horses run over rock? Or can one plow the sea with oxen? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Yet that's what Israel, in a sense, is trying to do. It's trying to live in this insane manner. Um, and then he returns to where we began the woes. Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. Now, the next part, well, let me, let me stop here for a minute. Um, this, a, a better or a more, I should say, a more, a specific description of what is going on is actually found 200 years later in Isaiah's curse on Judah. Because Judah, even after 200 years, having seen what happened to Israel, still falls into the same pattern. So in a sense, it's just as crazy. But you can see the sins of Israel and what was happening that Amos mentions by the way, Judah, uh, the, by the way Isaiah does in very specific detail. So what is the reason for Israel's fall? So at the bottom, you'll see this long um, paragraph that's next to the last page and the last page. It's a long section, but it gives you an idea of what the sins of both nations are. They repeat each other. It says, Woe to those who join house to house, who connect field with field until no space remains. Right? You're buying up everything from the poor. You're taking their land, field to field. You're taking their homes. So you see the, the whole idea is there. But he says, many houses shall be in ruins, large and fine, with no one living there. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to the, in the pursuit of strong drink, lingering late and flamed by wine, banqueting on wine with harp and lyre, just like God said he hates the sound of their instruments. Later he, he 
uh, mocks the people who improvise music to the harp and compose melodies while they're lying on their couches. So it's the same thing. Therefore, my people, um, but the deeds of the Lord, they do not regard the work of his hands. They do not see. Therefore, my people go into exile for lack of understanding. Then down to the last bold part on, the, on this page. Woe to those who tug at guilt with cords of perversity and at sin as if with cart ropes. Who say, let him make haste, let him speed his work, then we may see it. On with the plan of the Holy One of Israel. Let it come to pass that we may know it. Right? That's the mockery. Let God punish me. Where's, where's his punishment? So maybe now we're starting to see people who don't even believe in God anymore. Right? He's saying, let him do what he needs to do. Then the last one is, or the next one is kind of the encompassing one because this has been humanity's problem since literally the Garden of Eden story. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, right? Who flip everything, who change darkness to light and light into darkness, who change bitter to sweet and sweet to bitter, right? To switch morality. And now what was evil is considered to be good or holy or normal, and what was good is now considered to be evil or bad or judgmental or whatever we want to say at this time. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own view. Those who acquit the guilty for bribes and deprive the innocent of justice, for they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of hosts and scorned the holy word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord blazes against them. So basically what Isaiah speaks of Judah in the uh, um, 500s is what um, Isaiah, or is what Amos is speaking in the 700s to his own people, his own um, idea. And to make it clear, Amos deflates any idea that their military is going to save them. That's what verse 13 what it means, although we don't know the references. He says, You who rejoice in Lodabar, say, Have we not by our own strength seized Karname for ourselves? Those are two cities that Jeroboam II, the current king, had conquered. And so it looked like through all these military victories that there was no one who could stand against Israel. But the prophet is warning them, Don't, don't fall into that trap. Don't believe these false hopes by your conquest. It's only going to be a slight storm or calm before the storm hits. Because literally in 30 years, at the end of Hosea's time period, Assyrians will rise up again and they will turn on all those nations that were mentioned in the first chapters. They will conquer, destroy all of them. And that will include Israel. And they'll even lay siege to Judah, but will not end up conquering it because they turned to the Lord for a little bit. Um, and so the Lord ends his final one by sort of telling them. He says, verse 14, Look, I am raising up against you, house of Israel, oracle of the Lord, the God of hosts. So again, those two titles. A nation that shall oppress you from Lebel Hamath even to the Wadi Araba. Those are the extreme northern and southern uh, borders of Israel. So in other words, the whole nation's falling. All of you are falling. And so that's sort of the last of the, of the woes. So not being able to get Israel to return by summoning them, reminding them of who they are, reminding them of their covenant status, their special um, election before God, that doesn't work. So now the threats begin, the, the, the things that will worry them. Um, and so even that, though, really doesn't work. Now, one last thing before we end this handout. Um, going back to that statement where they simply aren't concerned or they're indifferent. They said, um, how does he put it? Who are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Right? Evil's going on around them. And it's interesting because some people are obviously indulging in the evil themselves, but others are probably just indifferent. You know, falling into that pattern. Well, I'm, I'm not living that way, so what's the big deal? Where reality is, 
we're supposed to meant we're meant as Christians and, and Israelites were meant before to really show that difference. Now, if you go back, let's see. Go to footnote 69. We now show you the opposite of those who do care about what's going on and refuse to take part in it. Now, this one comes from Isaiah and has to do with the city of Jerusalem and the temple there. But it's the same idea, except it's the opposite. Where in Amos' time in Israel, the people, for the most part, are unconcerned by the fact that the nation has fallen into the worst immorality and spiritual low that it's ever experienced. When Isaiah comes forth and God sends him to speak his punishment upon the holy city of Jerusalem and the temple there, he instead tells them who's going to be saved. And look how they're described. So um, Isaiah gets this word from the Lord in this vision. Then he cried aloud for me to hear. So God, come you scourges of the city. And there were six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a weapon of destruction in his hand. In their midst was a man dressed in linen with a scribe's case at his waist. They came and stood beside the bronze altar. That's the outside altar at the temple in Jerusalem. So notice he sees six men, angels, with their destroying weapons, and then a seventh man, who's dressed in linen with a, with a book. Does that sound familiar to any story in the New Testament? What Christ looks like when John sees him in Revelation, standing in his white, the book. So it's Christ. Christ is there with the seven to pronounce the judgment. Then the glory of God of Israel moved off the cherub and went up to the threshold of the temple. So God's glory is leaving the ark. The ark might still be there, but it's not going to have his presence anymore. He's leaving because he's abandoning his city because of their sins. He called to the man dressed in linen with a scribe's case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, pass through the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and mark an X. Literally, the word in Hebrew is ta. Mark a ta on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the abominations practiced within it. In other words, mark those who are concerned by all the evil that's happening around them by their own people, kinsmen, etc. Mark those who have remained faithful to me, who are bothered by all the evil going on. Now, the, <laughs> that's the... the word in Greek is tau. And what the Hebrew tau looks like so it literally says mark an X or excuse me, mark a cross. Mark the sign of the cross on those who will be spared when judgment falls. So it's its own version almost of the um, Passover. Those marked with the tau will not be harmed. It's not by accident Franciscans used this. It was this verse that St. Francis chose the Ta to be used because he felt at his time that the church was like Israel or Judah in Isaiah's time. The priests were corrupt. The people were indifferent. Money was the new king, which he had lived himself as the son of the wealthy merchant. And so the Franciscans marked themselves off in remembrance of what had happened in the vision with the sign of a cross, which then would become their, the symbol of their order. So he goes on, he says, pass through the city after him. So Jesus goes through and marks the sign of the cross on those to be saved. Then after the six angels then pass through after him. And to the others, he said in my hearing, pass through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eyes spare. Do not take pity. Old and young, male and female, women and children, wipe them out. But do not touch anyone marked with the sign of the cross. So even so, the story is interesting in a lot of ways. It's interesting because it's the exact opposite of what happens in Israel because you have people who are saved precisely because they're disgusted by what has happened to the majority of their friends and family members and co-religionists. 
it's also interesting because it's, you know, um, 500 years before Jesus, people are saved by having the sign of the cross marked on their foreheads. It goes back even earlier than that, though, because remember when the Passover, the you had to mark the sign on the two lentils and doorposts, which would be two signs of the cross. So the symbol has been there in different ways throughout. And then those who were in Revelation with me, you saw that John sees them being marked with the sign of the seal of the living God. So this symbolism. But the main point here is, you know, God does take notice of those who remain faithful even when the majority is falling away. And he does take steps to, in, to ensure that they, you know, will be protected from, quote, whatever's coming. Whatever uh, is being brought about, he will protect them from that. So um, we kind of end this part and heading into the very last section will now be five symbolic visions. And after the first three, you have this little interlude, which is very interesting, which talks about Amos um, being opposed by the high priest of these Israelite temples um, to try to stop his ministry. But let's go ahead and let me, I can, if there's any questions right now, but I'll also pass out um, the last main handout, and then I'll pass out the little small one that goes with it. So that's the, that's the last chapters of, of Amos. And then, like I said, I did want to compare and contrast him with Hosea. So I basically give you a really basic overview of the prophet Hosea in four pages um, to show how he, he complements and differs from the prophet Amos, both of them sent to Israel in their last time period. Well, so, and Constantine was saved Right. The cross too is that, right. in is that, was that, was that um, seen from script, uh, scripture biblical? Yeah, I mean that's that's sort of seen as the same thing, especially because the three letters he sees are very interesting. Because in Greek it's just the name Jesus, but in Latin it stands for um, in this sign in hoc signe. You'll, you will conquer, because that's what he hears the voice say. So in the, the imagery in both is, um, is both biblical, and it's interesting that it uses both. It, it can uh, stand for both of the, quote, religious languages of the church, both Greek and Roman. Um, that's why later you'll have the Franciscan, again, um, uh, Bernadine of Siena, We'll, you'll, you can look up the devotion to the holy name of Jesus. And this is the monogram that Franciscans use. So the monogram was placed, and then just the statement of the name Jesus that you pray um, over and over again, very, very slowly, deliberately. Um, it's St. Bernardine of Siena who adds the word Jesus to the Hail Mary. Blesses the fruit of thy womb. That's how it was said for the first several hundred years. And then the name Jesus is added. So um, all that's connected also to uh, Franciscan sort of spirituality. So the whole image of the cross, all the, the things like that are part of um, the whole Christian tradition. But uh, the Franciscans have really made that sort of a central component of their spirituality. Because in, in English, we can see, say that the three core devotions of the Franciscans, in English you can call them the three C's, it's not true in Latin, but the three C's are the crib, the cross, and communion. Those are the three central devotions, right? The incarnation, which of course the Franciscans, specifically St. Francis himself, made so popular. I mean, Christmas was a big feast, but it wasn't right. celebrated the way we celebrate it now. With, you know, with Christmas carols were invented by the Franciscans, the creche, the manger scenes were all invented by the Franciscan. Because for Francis, he felt it important that the imminence, the nearness of God, so close that he had literally become one of us, was especially important because in his time period, he felt that God was worshiped as so transcendent 
that the average person didn't really have a deep relationship with God. They had to only have it with the saints because God was too far away. And so he wanted to bring that back. And then, of course, the cross, and Francis himself has the stigmata, the first person in history to receive it, and no one's received it in the way he did since. So you have the Paschal Mystery, which, of course, is the central thing of all Christianity, but uh, the Franciscans, that's why they're penitents, and uh, the mystery of the stigmata and all the things like that, and then ultimately communion, which is the Holy Eucharist, which is the reception of right, all this in this unique sacrifice. And in each of them, Francis being who he was, the reason he chose these three is he said the three of them showed the humility of God more than anything else. Right, he became incarnate, which is absolute humility, because he became, he moved from being the infinite, perfect, all powerful, to being a tiny little baby, weak, everything is a human being. Uh, the Paschal Mystery, he allowed his own creation to murder and kill him, and didn't just turn around then after he rose to destroy them all, but instead used that as the very means of his forgiveness and salvation. And then the Eucharist is still that way because he says <clears throat> um, the Eucharist is, is our ongoing symbol of God's humility because um, God, Jesus, allows himself to be called down from heaven by, at any time by the hands of an unworthy priest. And he, they call and he comes. And so the image being of, of really all these three for Francis were uh, deep uh, images of God's um, humility. Um, you know, for Francis, it's always going to the bottom because that's where God is. And so um, uh, Francis took issue with the uh, first pagan idea and then developed by a lot of the church later uh, scholastic people we had God at the top, and then below him you had angels, then humans, then animals, plants, inanimate, so on and so forth, each with their own hierarchy, right? Angels have different hierarchies. The church has different hierarchies from pope to bishop to animals are different. Francis looked at that and said, that's not how it is at all. <laughs> he said it's exactly the opposite. God is at the bottom, and like Prometheus of old, he holds up this fragile world on his shoulders so that the angels are supposed to, in turn, serve human beings, and humans are, in turn, to serve the creation. And God is at the bottom of it all. He's still omnipotent, infinite, etc., but that's where he is. And, um, and Francis was very sort of, I mean, he really understood Scripture well. He said, you know, when Paul talks about uh, Jesus becoming human uh, in his famous statement to the, uh, um, the Philippians, I think, to the Philippians or the Colossians, um, he says this, who though God, Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself. Now that word emptied himself, in the original Greek and in the Latin Vulgate, the word is literally poured himself out. And so Francis, who was not a biblical scholar, but he was smart, he says, when you pour liquid out, where does it always go? To the lowest place. And that's what Jesus did. So he became a human being. He humbled himself, became even further than a human being by becoming a criminal. And not only a criminal, the worst considered type of criminal who was killed by the state as a traitor, death on a cross. And in the very next statement, Paul says, because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name above every name. Because of what? because of his humility. See, this is the weird thing that Francis understood that Paul is saying that none of us get. 
Paul does not say we know he was God because he rose from the dead or because he did miracles because most of that had been done in the Old Testament or by others. Elijah raised people from the dead, multiplied bread. None of the things Jesus did was singular. Even the resurrection, Paul doesn't use as the absolute proof. What is the proof that Jesus was God? And this is the weird part. is his humility. Because only God is truly humble. And then from there, Francis then moved to the story of the Last Supper in John and the foot washing. And in that discussion between France, uh, Peter and, and um, Jesus, Jesus says, you call me Lord and Master, and I am. A lot of people miss. He finally admits to them, I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the Lord, I'm divine, I'm the master. Yet, what does he then tell them to do? If I'm doing this, if I'm serving people in the most lowest possible way, washing their feet, which only slaves did, and not only slaves, the lowest slaves of the household, you have to do just like me. Right? To be like God is to go to the bottom and serve from there to lift others up, to, bring, to start that. And so um, that's sort of the, I mean, it's the whole teaching of the church, but the Franciscans, like I said, have a very specific charism connected to that. And as the Franciscans believe, and I guess the church at large, in some sense, at least the popes, um, no one ever did it better than him, with the exception of the Blessed Virgin. That is why he was given the stigmata in a way that no one since ever has. Francis's stigmata were actual nails. That's why the last year and a half of his life he could not walk because the nails formed from his flesh there. And the first time he pulled them out painfully and they regrew. So his weren't holes like Padre Pio. His were nails that were beaten in on one side and the head on the other. And then the feet, they went through the bottom so he could no longer walk the last year and a half of his life. Wow. Um, and then he had the side as well the, that constantly bled until his final death. And so what Franciscans had always said, because he had become so transformed into Christ's image interiorly, God then did exteriorly to him what he did to Jesus so that the world could see that he was the greatest saint that had ever arisen since the mother, our Blessed Mother. Um, like I said, to some extent, the church buys that because the popes gave Francis a title that no one else has, no other saint, Alter Christus, another Christ. So at least in the understanding of what he did and what he returned to the, to the faith, that's what you have. And speaking of which, it's funny that I mentioned the three. It must be on my mind because we're doing it now. Because here you have the chaplet, which has the three sections. And for each day, you have one on the cross, one on the crib, and one on the communion. For um, how you recall that day after day, those three um, things. Okay, so next week should be the last one. We only have that last handout, plus the very small one, which will just take a few minutes to go over. Um, so that should be our... Our final one. I haven't really come up with anything yet for our next class. Please feel free to email me if you have some topics. I'll always consider them, you know, just because I've been doing this for a long time, guys, like 25 years. It gets hard to think up new things. And then you're always worried, well, I've done this one before. How many have heard it? How many did this? So really, if you guys have any particular ones, email them when the thing goes out so uh, Quinn can give those to me and I'll start looking at them because it may... Sometimes I just like to be told what to do, right? I mean, sometimes it's just easier. Just like, just tell me what to, to teach on and then I'll do it. So, okay. Um, let's go ahead and end in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Spirit, Paraclete, our Lord and giver of life, please continue to pour yourself out upon us from the Father and Son, to enlighten our mind with a deeper and deeper understanding of God's love for us, 
And as we experience that love and see it reflected in our lives, may it also enliven our heart in response with a deeper love for God. And through our love for him, for a deeper, pure love of ourselves, the love of our neighbor, and ultimately, even to those of our enemies. We ask, Lord, that through this time of Lent, you just remove any hindrances that still remain in us, that we turn over to you, that in any way block the flow of your spirit and his love throughout us, Lord. And we just ask that you continue to draw us ever closer to you in that intimacy through your son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the spirit, in faith, hope, and charity, so that we may worthily celebrate the great feast of Easter and the resurrection of your son and continue to enlighten the world until we ourselves are called to share in that glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll see you next week, guys, for the wrap.